Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to this webinar today. Uh, this is titled uh, The Future of Drone Automation in Industry, um, and it's hosted by us, uh, the Connected Places Catapult. Uh, so my name is David, um, and I'm a systems engineer uh, working for the Catapult across our um, air mobility projects, uh, including the Pathfinder Catalyst program, um, which is uh, what this webinar forms a part of. So I'm going to be taking you through the uh, agenda today um, and facilitating the Q&A sessions. Um, and just a reminder before we begin uh, that this session is being recorded um, so that you can watch it back later um, or share it uh, with colleagues uh, for anyone who's not managed to make it today. Um, and it will be available on the Connected Places website um, after the event and on our social feed. So, so keep, a, keep an eye out for that. Brilliant. So onto the agenda. Um, we've got some uh, great content lined up for you today, um, all centered around uh, drone automation. Uh, and what's really great is that we'll be hearing uh, both the perspectives of the um, end users. Um, so we've got Magnox and Network Rail, um, and we'll be hearing from the solution providers. So um, we've got Herotech and Drone Cloud. Um, and that's what this uh, webinar is really all about. It's about starting that conversation uh, between the uh, end users and the providers, how these about how these technologies can be um, used uh, to drive benefits in, in the organizations of, of you guys listening uh, and across the UK. So please do get engaged um, in the session. Um, you know, ask questions using our Q and A box, um, or start conversations in the chat, because um, that's the reason we're all we're all here. So just to quickly take you through the agenda. Um, so firstly, we'll be hearing from Hannah Chu. Um, so she's the Catapult's director of air mobility, uh, and she'll be setting the scene um, for today's talk. Um, we'll then pass on to Ricky from Network Rail to talk about um, what they're currently doing. Um, and where they see uh, the future uh, for network rail using drones. Um, then we'll go to Jan from Drone Cloud, um, who, who uh, and Drone Cloud work with network rail, and we'll be hearing about uh, their role in supporting um, network rail's kind of scaling of their operations. So after a short Q and A, um, we'll then hear from Ed um, at here at Tech Eight, um, and they're really pushing the the envelope in, in terms of their drone in a box technologies, uh, and they'll be accompanied by one of their end user partners, Magnox. Um, who take care of nuclear decommissioning uh, in the UK. So really excited to hear from them all. Um, I hope you are too. Um, just like I said before, please do get engaged. Um, you can ask questions anytime using the, the uh, Q&A function. Um, and there's a separate Q&A function and chat, just be mindful. So you can use the chat uh, if you want to start conversations or put your contact details in, you know, a bit of a virtual business card, um, or use the Q&A if you want to ask questions to the, to the uh, people presenting today. Um, now, you can ask questions at any time. Uh, we'll save them up and we'll address them in the Q&A sessions. Um, so that's enough uh, intro from me. I'm going to hand to Hannah, um, who's going to set the scene um, with her talk. Thanks, Hannah. Morning, all. Thank you, David. Good morning, and thank you for joining us to hear about the future of drones automation in industry. Before diving into the topic for today, I'd like to just take a moment to introduce the air mobility and airport ecosystem at Connected Places Catapult. This is one of the newest and fastest growing areas of interest for the Catapult, and from what you're here today, it's easy to see why. We're working in two key areas, aviation sustainability and future aviation. Aviation sustainability is concerned with what we do today in commercial flight, ground ops, airport experience and the like, working to improve this as we move into net zero in the next decade. This drive towards net zero is a huge opportunity for our UK based innovators to anchor value in the UK, including some of the drone uh, supply chain that are undoubtedly on the phone today. The second key area, future aviation, is all about the integration of new classes of vehicle into our skies, be that drones, advanced air mobility or sub-regional vehicles. As part of our future aviation work for several years, Connected Places Catapult has led the DFT funded Pathfinder programme. The Pathfinder programme has specifically focused on acceleration to beyond visual line of sight flight, BV loss. And that's where a pilot cannot see the vehicle. Our current regulatory framework only allows for visual line of sight without special permission. This situation is unsustainable to achieve the full potential of the drone industry. On our journey to full BV loss flight and the predicted 76,000 commercial drones operating in the UK by 2030, we need to see the uptake and use of drones today. There are many uses for drones in our current aviation regulatory framework, and this year the Pathfinder ran its Catalyst programme, looking at the state of the art, focusing specifically on what can be done 
with today's technology and demonstrating to a wider audience what can be achieved. Today's event is part of a series of events exploring the different use cases for the state-of-the-art drone application. We've already presented a case study for housing associations and have others coming up over the coming weeks and months in topics such as agriculture and coastal erosion. And of course, in March, we have our Big Bang event at Milton Keynes pulling this all together. Please see our website for more information on these and it would be great to see you all there too. So to kick off today's event, I would like to talk start by talking about the importance of drones to UK industry and infrastructure and why automation promises to make them even more valuable. I'll keep it at a high level and spoiler free because the people talking later will be bringing this to life with actual industry use cases. I'm just setting the context. So firstly, why drones at all? Drones provide a range of benefits across applications from agriculture, search and rescue, logistics, construction, transport and more. While each application varies, they are generally used to do things safer, faster, more cost effectively and provide better data outputs to support decision making. Into industry and solutions we're talking about today. These include time saving and money whilst doing inspections, supporting preventative maintenance programmes through regular surveys and monitoring large sites for progress and security. This can also reduce um, humans from danger uh, when we consider difficult spaces that need to be monitored. The UK government has recognised the importance of drones and we're seeing a lot of investment in drive for their development and adoption. For example, the Future Flight Challenge and the Pathfinder Catalyst programme. Next slide, please. What's the benefit of automation? Let's start with some facts about infrastructure and the development in the UK. These aren't the only use cases that drones can be applied to. This is just a selection to get your imagination firing. So when we think of roads alone, we've got 2,300 uh, 2, miles of motorway in the UK. There are 215,700 miles of minor roads. Mind boggles as to how we um, manage to monitor these manually. When we consider rail, Network Rail manages 20,000 miles of track, 30,000 bridges and thousands of signals. When we think about the power industry, the number of pylons in the UK is over 90,000. There are 4,300 miles of high voltage overhead lines in the UK and Wales alone. Bays have listed approximately 1,300 electricity generating sites, including renewables in the UK, operational in May last year. We have 120 commercial ports operating in the UK and in the construction industry, 2020 saw 100 billion of new work construction um, outputs in the Great Britain across public and private infrastructure in housing industry and commercial. So it's clear there is a lot going on in the UK and almost all of these assets and activities need inspections, maintenance and security. We always need to be on the lookout for how we can continually improve to sustainably manage our assets. And that's where the benefits for drones can come in to do things faster, safer and more cost effectively. The underpinning point here is about scale and economic viability, which automation um, unlocks. Drone automation is improving the business case for applications where drone use is already very compelling and it's enabling new applications which were not possible before. Next slide, please. So where is all this heading? Manual operation is good enough in lots of cases and that the Housing Association case study uh, does demonstrate that there are benefits, but we are heading towards a future where more and more use cases will become more viable due to the increasing levels of drone automation. So what we're going to hear about today in terms of network rails trials and Hero Tech 8's drone in a box technology, these are enablers that will take us there. So now it's over to our industry speakers. I'm excited that today we're going to hear from Ricky from Network Rail, Ed from Hero Tech 8, Jan from Drone Cloud, and Ian from Magnox. I'll hand over to Network Rail and Ricky. After a short video, Ricky will join us live. Many thanks for your attention today, and I hope you enjoy the event as, as much as I'm expecting to. Thank you very much. <laughs> Connected Places Catapult is the UK's innovation accelerator for cities, transport and places. 
As part of the Department for Transport funded Drone Pathfinder Catalyst program, we're here today with Network Rail to demonstrate the use of drones for maintenance, surveying, safety and incident response. So within our operations in Network Rail, we've got manned and unmanned aviation. And at the moment, we've got a fleet of drones and remote pilots that are carrying out various inspections around the infrastructure pretty much on a daily basis. The transition to using drones has not been easy, um, and it isn't easy today either. We all see the new shiny things on, uh, on social media and in the news, uh, and it's trying to manage what we can actually offer currently. And then there is the, the, the things outside of our control, um, regulatory uh, aspects, uh, and also the implementation of, of drones uh, within, within airspace. The biggest challenge we face really is that we we have 20,000 miles of track that we've got to inspect and maintain. And we don't have access panels all along that 20,000 miles. So it's, it's almost impossible to inspect and maintain that kind of infrastructure. This is where drones can assist. They're equipped with high resolution thermal and visual imaging cameras. They can rapidly assess the structural integrity of the railway tracks and power lines. They can evaluate suspected faults and even monitor environmental factors such as flooding. So the benefits of using the drones within Network Crowl is that we've been able to actually still carry out inspections of our assets without actually putting people in the hazardous environment. What excites me most about using drones within Network Crowl is what's coming next. We currently operate drones visual line of sight. By the end of this month, we should be operating drones on a proof of concept beyond visual line of sight. And the ability to be able to capture that data over a longer linear distance will make it more cost effective and more importantly safer um, to capture that data. The future of drones within any kind of um, infrastructure like ours is, well I'd almost say that uh, there are no limits for what we potentially can do. I truly believe in fully autonomous flights um, that can um, monitor and survey our network uh, and therefore keep it safer. Uh, and by, by using drones um, smartly and using the right drone for the right job, um, we, we know that we can, we can do better than we do today. It is something that we are working very hard um, to make reality, hopefully sooner rather than later. To find out more about how Connected Places Catapult are helping unlock the benefits of drone services, please get in touch. Good morning, my name is Ricky Carmichael and yes, I'm the head of air operations for Network Rail. Um, I am going to talk to you about, first of all, how we are uh, set up in Network Rail um, with, our, with our drone operations. Um, we have been using drones on various different levels for about six years now. Um, and it was set up as a, as a voluntary um, thing that, that people could sign up to become uh, drone pilots. Um, and we have found that this works um, well in supporting people in their day jobs where drones can assist them um, and make them um, work um, better, safer um, and, and more efficiently. Um, we have approximately 50 active uh, drone operators currently um, and we have probably about 120 to 130 drones that are spread across, across the company. We do also work with um, professional drone operators. So we have a framework of companies that we work with um, and they provide us with um, equipment, services uh, and training as well. Um, again, we have found the combination of, uh, of having both internal uh, uh, capability and then relying on, on um, our framework companies as a good, a good combination to ensure that we can answer most of the, of the tasks that, that we get uh, presented with uh, by our, our internal customers. Um, and then you can ask, well, why, why are we doing all of this? Um, one of the, of the main purposes are increased safety. Um, we have, um, as you've heard several times now, over 20,000 miles of, of track. And the track environment is a very dangerous environment, as I'm sure you can all appreciate. 
um, trains are unforgiving um, and they usually come at you at a, at a fair pace. Um, so if we can take um, people away from that dangerous environment and putting them on the side on a bridge or um, in a field where they can still uh, conduct the inspection work that we need to do to keep our infrastructure safe, well then that is obviously um, a very big, big plus for us. Um, and that would um, also help drive some efficiencies uh, and streamline um, certain uh, processes. Um, what we what we found, uh, as I said, we started about six years ago. Um, I personally joined the business about three and a half years ago. And what we've seen in the past few years is a, um, a big increase uh, in drone activities. Um, in 2019, we had a combined uh, total of 200 um, flights. Um, that's both internal and external uh, activity around our infrastructure. Um, and uh, at the end of 2021, we had registered um, just below three and a half thousand flights. So that is obviously a huge increase. Now, again, I got to point out that's not internal flights. That is uh, internal, it's external flights, and it's third, third party flights. So people that are not necessarily working with or for network rail, um, but it could be a photographer that's taking pictures of houses that are next to, to our, our tracks um, and, and the like. But obviously, this shows an enormous increase uh, in activities around our infrastructure. So what we did, um, and we did that with Drone Cloud, um, that was uh, to introduce a flight management system, um, and it it had it had two reasons um, to be introduced. Um, one of them was to ensure that there would be um, as small a chance as possible for any kind of of uh, collisions uh, in the air. Um, by, by, by our drones. Um, and first of all, we were obviously thinking internally, um, but it soon became uh, apparent that, that there was a, um, a big interest for this externally as well. Um, and um, it's still a, um, a project that's in, in progress and it probably always will be a product that's never finished because we keep finding new things that we can improve it with. However, it has been a great success um, and um, it, it's really pleasing to hear that it's not just network rail people that are happy to, to use it. Um, we have people from uh, all walks of life that's using this. Um, we obviously work closely with um, uh, the Bridge Transport Police who is using this as well. Um, and we are currently trying to work with um, BAE systems uh, and their CAD system to see if we can get, get the two systems to work together and therefore uh, be able to provide even more information because that's what's important to me that is to give the drone operators information about the environment that they're going to fly around in uh, and therefore hopefully um, allow them to make safe decisions about whether um, they should deploy a drone or not um, and that has been really important um, and it, it's something that that we are, are truly proud of um, and um, as I said, with the growing demand that we are seeing, um, we know that the, um, the collaboration with our, our flight management system is only going to expand. Um, the other side of the flight management system is, is more inward looking, um, and, and that has got to do with being able to manage um, our drone uh, operators, make sure that they are uh, conducting the flights that they, that they should to stay current. Um, we can monitor um, battery life. Uh, we can monitor where we are doing a lot of operations, for instance, um, what kind of drones are popular to use. Um, and this is all something that, that provides me um, information about uh, how to, to strategize for the future and, and where we as a business um, want to take um, the drone use uh, in the future. Um, next slide, please. So we have, um, we have 
obviously developed a lot of various uh, dro uh, use cases um, across the business over the last few years. And, and there is a, a few of them that is highlighted here. I'm not going to go through all of them. I just want to um, maybe talk about a few. Um, the wagon and depot inspections uh, were quite um, was quite successful. Um, and to set the scene, um, when we have got um, big cargo trains uh, with with lots of wagons, and, and we've all seen them, they, they, they can be miles long sometimes. Um, the only way that we had in the past uh, to know what was in a wagon was literally for a person to crawl up and stick their head over the top and look what's in there. That is obviously very time consuming and dangerous. So the fact that we can now deploy a drone um, and they can monitor the wagons as they roll into a depot um, and the, the guys and girls on the ground can see what's in, in the wagons and, and can make decisions about what, what, uh, what needs to be done with, with the wagons, whether they need to be emptied or filled up or whatever it is that they're in the depot for, that has really helped um, with, again, with the efficiency and um, and uh, again, from a safety perspective, that has really been a, a, a good one. Um, bridges and viaducts are another, another good one. Um, in the past, for certain inspections, um, we would have had to close a line, um, stop all traffic, get scaffolding up, um, get a team out, uh, usually quite a sizable team, crawling up uh, on, a, on a scaffolding and inspecting um, a bridge or a viaduct. Um, instead, today we can stand well away from the from the track. Um, the trains can can uh, can come and go, uh, and we can nip in and out and and do the inspections as is, is required. And again, it's not just for the person that is looking at it. Um, we now have data that we can take back to the office that can be shared with colleagues, um, and therefore we get better use of the information and the data that we capture. Um, the last one I'd highlight is the switches and crosses, uh, crosses inspections. Um, this is very, very localized use of drones. Um, we do these kind of inspections on a weekly basis all over the country. So I can, I'm sure you can understand that's quite uh, time consuming and, and work heavy. Um, and the fact that we can uh, use a drone to go in and, and check these um, means that we can do them faster. Um, and again, we have recorded uh, evidence about the, the state of the equipment, which again is, is an important part of, of the outcome of this. Next slide, please. But obviously that there is a lot, a lot more use cases and um, we could highlight a lot of, of other things. Um, but I wanted to talk to you guys about the BB Loss project that we did last year. Um, and I'm sure some of you would recognize Paul from the video from the beginning as well and, and know that Paul um, is no longer with Network Rail, unfortunately. Um, but our BB loss project was, was definitely, um, Paul was definitely the driving force behind that. Um, and we worked very hard as a team um, to ensure that that, that became a, a successful uh, little proof of, of concept. Um, we did it because we wanted to. We wanted to show that Network Rail is serious about using drones. Um, and we wanted to, to show that it was possible to conduct a BB loss flight uh, over, um, over uh, our, our infrastructure um, and to do that safely. But what we did learn as well was that we are far from um, at the at the finished product, we are far from being able to roll this out as business as usual. There are lots of factors that are going to influence how we can uh, use um, BB loss in the future. Um, one of them are environmental. Um, I think we were all surprised about how how big a beating our, our little drone took on the day, um, and we are now looking at how we can. Um, step between VLOS, which is really serving us well today at, at, at conducting local uh, surveys um, and using EVLOS as a stepping stone to get to BVLOS uh, once uh, all the, the, um, the things that are in our way uh, to, to use BVLOS today is, uh, is sorted out. 
Um, but we are obviously looking at the future. Um, we are looking at um, a different operating model. Um, we're looking at making sure that we can offer um, our customers, and that is the, the public, um, a better service. And that means that we will be more flexible um, and more efficient in how we um, in how we use our drone technology. Um, and we want to be able to scale this up. Um, as I said, the, the use cases are very local. Um, we need a way so we can roll it out nationwide. Um, we are looking at new kinds of drones. Um, we are probably still using very um, low tech, if we can call them that, drones. Um, and I'm very keen to explore uh, other types uh, of drones out there, uh, drones that might not fly uh, in, in, the, in the airspace that we are currently occupying uh, and how that can affect um, what, what it is that we're trying to achieve. Um, but as I say, we are looking towards um, what is going to happen to some of the things that are on my um, list of concerns um, that needs to be addressed before I believe BB loss will, will be rolled out um, and, and be business as usual. Um, and for me, it is looking at um, the training requirements. I think there needs to be um, a different uh, kind of, of training regime for, for BB loss operations. It's about uh, manufacturing standards of drones. Um, so we can make sure that the equipment you, we're using is actually fit for purpose. And then it's obviously the, the, the big one uh, of integrating uh, drone operations into our uh, into to the airspace around us. It's all very challenging. It's all very exciting. And um, I for once can't wait to see what the future um, is going to bring us. So that was all for me. Um, and I am now going to hand you over to Jan um, from Drone Cloud. Um, so all yours, Jan. Hello. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm uh, Jan Domaratsky, CEO of uh, Drone Cloud. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks, Ricky, for um, for, for that um, great set of slides and uh, and and. Uh, and passing over to me, um, I guess the most important thing really for, for, for me to say is that it's been a real pleasure working with uh, with Network Rail um, and collectively pushing the industry forward. Um, I, I really do feel like we're um, we're partners, um, and, uh, um, and 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 that's something that's really uh, really exciting for for, for us. Uh, next slide, please. So what is, uh, what is Drone Cloud? Uh, in a nutshell, Drone Cloud combines operations, management, and back-end aviation systems into a single platform. Um, what, what does that really mean? Uh, first and foremost, Drone Cloud is a, an operations management platform uh, for drones born out of the need for managing a, a growing drone operation. Previously, it would have been considered as pure, uh, a pure fleet management uh, system. We're talking flight planning, fleet management, compliance teams, airspace management, and approval amongst others. However, it's the technical back-end aviation systems and services that will power the more complex drone operations of the future. So the types of things that Ricky was uh, was talking about, um, network rail uh, wanting to, to, to do with drones around uh, more automation um, and beyond visual line of sight. Um, all of those types of things really need uh, the back-end aviation systems to, to support that. Um, and we're working um, on innovation projects like uh, the Future Flight Challenge uh, with partners such as Network Rail and Hero Tech 8 to develop and integrate the technology that will open up um, that automation um, and beyond visual line of sight and eventually um, full autonomy. Uh, I'll come on to, uh, um, the, let's say, um, a little bit of a uh, an understanding of the difference between um, how we see uh, automation and autonomy, um, and I think that's a theme that will uh, will also follow on in some of the uh, um, with some of the other speakers uh, for from Hero Tech Eight um, as well. Um, if we look at the diagram here, um, really, I guess yeah, we're, we're trying to to get that point across that 
Um, in the here and now, so for the operations of today, we really need a drone operations management platform to support the types of operations that Ricky um, just uh, really eloquently described earlier. But for example, the types of operations that Network Rail are doing to, to today. Um, but that, that needs to be combined, as I said, with those back-end aviation systems to support the types of operations we want to do tomorrow. Drone Cloud um, itself, um, uh, I guess, what does it deliver? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's user-friendly. Um, that's, that's something that's really important to us. So it's quite a visual um, platform. It's, uh, um, it's, it's very scalable. Um, and we make sure that all of the, uh, um, all, all of the, the, the functionality exists in, uh, in, in, in a workflow orientated uh, uh, manner. And that's something that's going to become increasingly important as we start to unlock the, uh, um, the, the more exotic uh, flights of the future, for example, beyond visual line of sight. Um, it's also um, uh, designed um, as a, um, a microservices uh, type platform. So that means that we are really geared up for um, not just developing the, um, the, the aviation systems uh, um, of the future, but also understanding that this is such a grand challenge that we will need to be integrating with other um, key industry partners um, and we need to be configured um, so that we can integrate the types of services we need um, to rapidly enable um, the type of functionality we want. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Okay, so what did we do really to um, to, to help uh, um, Network Rail building off uh, um, the, the the really uh, nice um, comments from from Nikki uh, from Ricky sorry earlier. Uh, well, when we uh, when, when we started uh, the, the the process um, uh, with uh, with Network Rail, the drone operation uh, there was struggling to efficiently centrally manage the pilots um, and the fleet. Um, whilst uh, keeping compliant um, and also importantly deconflicting with uh, other um, drone operators. Um, and Drone Cloud has helped secure that operation by allowing it to, to grow and focus on the business of flying and delivering to um, internal customers. One of the other things that we did um, for Network Rail, and, and Ricky touched on it, was uh, we developed a first of its kind notification system, um, which allowed, uh, which is currently allowing, uh, external drone operators uh, from the public, so that's both commercial and recreational um, drone operators, to advise Network Rail of uh, flights over or near their line um, network or built infrastructure. Um, and that's something that's really, I think, Im important and it underpins one of the uh, um, points that R Ricky was uh, uh, making earlier around um, you know, everything we're doing really in this industry um, can be boiled down to um, information um, and safety. So that was one of the key things that we wanted to, to, to work on together to make sure that not just the internal uh, network rail pilots were all conducting their operations as safely um, as possible, uh, but also that we introduced that ability for external uh, um, pilots and, uh, and operators to um, advise network rail of what they're doing um, so that then network rail can, uh, um, can help those guys um, uh, make sure that what they're doing is, uh, is, is done as safely as possible. Because at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is you know, live uh, rail uh, lines um, and, they are, and they are dangerous. Um, and, and we need to make sure that, that, we, that we do things as safely as possible. Uh, what's really interesting uh, for us about that is that when we started that process, um, of, uh, of, of putting that system in place for people to be able to notify Network Rail. Uh, we weren't sure, to be honest, how much engagement there would be because, uh, and, and Ricky, I, I'm, I'm hoping you're okay with me saying this, that, that, um, that it, it, um, Network Rail uh, isn't what, what is classed as an air navigation service provider, so uh, can't, let's say, mandate uh, people uh, um, not to fly um, over or around their line network. Um, they can only uh, politely uh, request um, notifications. Um, we were absolutely bowled over by the engagement uh, from, from the wider um, drone industry and, and the public. Um, and the number of uh, um, notifications has, has really staggered us both, I think, which is really good because it, it proves to the industry that, um, you know, in a way, if we build it, they will come. So if we put the systems in place, people will engage. Um, I've, I've heard other people in, in other scenarios um, look at the, you know, the drone industry as a, a little bit like the Wild West, 
Um, and uh, in, in some ways, uh, you know, that's uh, that's true. But I, I think what we're what we're really trying to demonstrate here, together and as an industry, is um, you know, maturity is is is, is coming. Um, in 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 many ways, it's already here, um, and uh, and and we're pushing that um, to try and make sure that, that that people are doing things properly. And when we give them the systems to do that, people do engage. Uh, Network Rail have been using a. Uh, um, uh, drone cloud now for over a year, um, and uh, and I think the improvements in terms of control, speed, um, and traceability speak for themselves. Uh, and I'd, I'd hope uh, you would uh, back me up on that. Um, but what's really, I guess, um, as important to us as securing the, uh, the the operations of today in Network Rail is is really to echo what Ricky was saying there, and 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 is building a pathway um, to the the types of operations that Network Rail and others uh, want to do in the future. Uh, that's something that actually Network Rail built into the tender process. They wanted to make sure that who, whoever provided the platform for them um, would actually provide a pathway um, to, to, to allow for um, BV loss and, and other um, more autonomous flight in the future. Um, and we're super excited to be working with uh, not just Network Rail, but uh, um, uh, other partners such as HeroTech 8 um, on, on that journey. Uh, to, to help uh, Network Rail and others expand their drone capability. Um, and drones in the box is, uh, is something that uh, is, is really exciting for us. And we're, um, we're, we're happy to be helping support that, um, the, the development and the integration of drones in a box um, into, a, um, in, into a scalable model for Network Rail and uh, others. So ne uh, next slide, please. So I touched on this uh, um, in the previous uh, slide, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the numbers, uh, and I guess the shape of the graph here speaks for itself. Um, we've increased overall, um, and I say this, we, you know, because I said it's a, a partnership between us and, and Network Rail, we've increased the flights uh, by over 500%. Um, and that's a mixture of, uh, as Ricky said, internal and external uh, flights. Um, and I think one of the other metrics, which is really interesting here is that the overall approval uh, process um, as part of networks, Network Rail's um, internal and external um, flight uh, approval and notification system previously used to take around 14 days and was really um, time consuming and, and, and kind of process heavy. Um, with, the, uh, with the Drone Cloud platform and the um, notification system that we put in place, that has now reduced to um, under an hour. Um, and, uh, and, and, and is really a stepping stone to, um, to, to be able to deliver effectively um, automated uh, um, approvals and, and notifications. So that's something I think we're collectively quite proud of. Um, really, we're, we're showing that, that uh, not only have we secured the operation of Network Rail um, today, uh, but we're building that growth um, uh, in, into the, the operation there um, and really starting it on that journey um, uh, to, to, to where we all want to get to, which is where we're really opening up the taps to, uh, um, to, to mass, large scale, uh, large volume uh, flights across the, uh, the, the, the network um, nationally. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, we've got a, a, a diagram here, which is actually um, from a uh, um, connected uh, places catapult um, uh, a paper uh, entitled Enabling UTM in the UK. Um, I, I'm not going to, to go through every single element of the, of the diagram, uh, but really just to, to, to give a bit of an overview of, um, of how we are going to develop um, and build the, the systems um, and the processes uh, um, that we're gonna need to unlock uh, the types of um, drone flight, uh, the automation, the autonomy um, that is going to be required to deliver the, um, the, the operating model that, that the Ricky was referring to in the future. And hopefully this will pave uh, um, uh, a way to um, the uh, subsequent um, uh, guest speakers from, uh, from HeroTech 8. From, from the drone cloud side, we really see ourselves um, as, uh, as should we say, uh, an underpinning or supporting uh, or in a supporting role um, of, of, uh, of enabling the EV loss and uh, automated and autonomous uh, flights in the future. Um, and, and we're working with uh, and key partners in the industry to, to um, unlock that. Um, 
In the diagram here, um, there's, there's a, you can see um, UTM-SP mentioned. So UTM or Uncrewed Traffic Management, SP uh, for service provider. Now, um, what we really mean by, um, by, by UTM is uh, um, it, it's, it's fairly akin to air traffic control uh, for, for, for drones. Um, uh, but it's, uh, it's built up of a number of services that are required to enable um, the, the, the flights of the future. Um, those, those services are, for example, conflict resolution, detect and avoid, uh, live telemetry, and links to other back-end aviation systems, for example, uh, crude air traffic control. What we're really talking about here is, is, again, information and safety. So it's building a picture of the airspace um, and the um, and the systems and services that are required to um, to, to 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 help us uh, ensure that drones can operate ideally in the end state in shared airspace. Um, so that's you know, uncrewed uh, aircraft or drones operating in the same airspace as um, as, as crewed aircraft. Uh, and I guess the real the, the main point I want to make here is that. Um, what we're not held back by is, is uh, hardware or software. Um, you know, we, have, we have a lot of that already developed. We've got no lack of innovation or talent, um, uh, but really what we do need to do now is start to create um, a body of safety evidence um, ar around our ability to, uh, to, to, to fly drones um, in um, initially uh, segregated, but then eventually shared airspace safely and reliably so that we can work with the regulators um, to, um, to allow us to do that at scale. And then we need to work together to create the operating models um, to do that. Um, and, and from the Drone Cloud perspective, we see that as being uh, um, delivered as, uh, um, as packaged services. Next slide, please. So uh, Ricky touched on this uh, um, before. So there was a, um, uh, a depot proof of concept that, that we did uh, with um, our, our partners, an operational uh, drone company partner called Future Aerial Innovations um, and Hero Tech 8. Um, and uh, and as, as Ricky said, it was, a, it was a real success. I think everyone was really happy with the, the, the result of that. And it really kind of paves the way for how we can use drones in a box um, in the future, and also how we can start to do that in a way that, that uh, is, is scalable. Uh, if you can jump onto the next slide, please. So the, the aims of, uh, um, of, of, of uh, this proof of concept um, were, were quite simple, really. Um, they fall into two parts. Um, so one, we wanted to look at just what, what's the feasibility of a drone in the box in itself. Um, and I think, uh, um, what will give a cheer to uh, the, the Hero Tech 8 guys um, uh, further on in this uh, session is that um, that was a resounding success. Um, but more importantly, it was also to, to, to pave the way for um, effectively creating a pathway for deploying multiple um, unattended drones in, in, in a box. Um, and so yeah, what are the challenges um, required uh, to, to, to achieve that? Um, and, and where can this fit in um, into an operating model for, 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 for network rail. I've used that word several times, and I think that's something that, that, that is really important, is that we need to get that, that message across that, um, it, that there is no one size uh, fits all um, in terms of, of, of how we deploy these technologies. So it, it's, it's much about um, developing an operating model which, which contains the core um, elements that, that, that all drones need to access the airspace uh, let's say, repeatably, reliably, and safely. Um, but how can we do that in an operating model that, that works for, for a company like Network Rail um, and others? So next slide, please. Yeah, and if we could go into the ne next slide. Yeah, perfect. Um, so here, really, I'm not going to go into all of the, uh, um, the, the, the various applications here. Um, it, it, I just wanted to, to really get some... Uh, some visuals up for, from the um, proof, and a con, a proof of concept. Um, but, but really, um, I guess Ricky touched on it as well, the, the, the sky really is the limit when, once we get these, uh, um, uh, these, these drones in a box able to operate um, at scale, um, unattended and centrally managed and controlled. Um, so you know, the, 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 the ability to, uh, I guess, mitigate 
health and safety risks is probably one of the most uh, important uh, elements there, uh, probably the most important. But there's a number of other applications that really um, open up uh, um, options for, for, for the technology. And we'll be exploring those together um, in, uh, in, in, in future projects. Um, what, one point I'll, I'll, I'll bring to the attention there, and I think was raised in, in the initial um, opening, is that, that uh, all of what we're doing here allows us to, 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 to help chip away at that um, overall goal that we have collectively of re reducing our um, collective carbon footprint. So I think that's another um, good takeaway from that. Next slide, please. So I, I guess, uh, yeah, really just uh, wrapping up uh, um, uh, the drone cloud uh, section um, is the, um, the, the proof of concept we did uh, was uh, from our perspective, a resounding success. Um, it's got us super excited um, and we'll definitely be looking to, to uh, uh, implement that in a viable um, commercial operating model. Um, but I think we all need to be uh, collectively cognizant of the fact that there are a number of challenges that, that, that still um, exist. Um, and um, you know, we, we, we need to be working collectively um, to make sure that we can move from a, a position at the moment where we have uh, effectively to do things um, legally and safely. We have to um, create uh, segregated airspace uh, zones, um, which is something which is not uh, currently scalable. Um, and so we're working on uh, projects together with HeroTech 8, Network Rail and others um, to make sure that we can uh, expand the the scale of uh, of of, of uh, um, uh, beyond visual line of sight uh, flights and also uh, drone in a box services. Um, and one of the other things that that, that we're quite keen on from uh, from the drone cloud side is to make sure, uh, as I said, that the operating model for these types of uh, of, of of drones um, are packaged into services, which then can be delivered um, repeatedly. Um, centrally controlled and managed um, and at a um, huge scale. So um, I guess uh, that's it for me. I think uh, Ricky and I are now going to be um, heading into, some, into a Q&A session and then after that we'll be um, handing over to the uh, guys at HeroTech 8, if I understand correctly. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jan, and, um, and Ricky as well. Um, so yeah, if you both come back on camera, thank you. Um, we've had some really great engagement in the in the chat and the Q and A function, so thank you everyone for sending those through. Um, I'm going to start off with a, a question uh, for you, Ricky, um, and we've only got ten minutes, so please uh, we'll try and keep it concise, and we can follow up afterwards if, if we need to. Um, so John says, "Hi, Ricky. Great to see uh, great to see your presentation. Uh, inspiring as a regular rail user. Are you utilising the big data being collected to gain insights and trends over time, um, as well as specific use cases locally?" And have you put a monetary value on the data being collected? Uh, very good question. Um, um, yes, we do. Uh, we, we, we collate uh, the data. Um, and uh, the motto is kind of collect once, use many times. Uh, what we found is that even if we collect data for, for one particular project, uh, it can benefit uh, in other places of the business. Um, it's not perfectly set up yet. Um, it is something that we work on uh, exploring uh, on a daily basis. Um, and we know we can do more than what we are today, but we are definitely learning the benefit of the of the data that we are that we are collecting and, and using it across the business. Brilliant, thank you. And, and maybe a follow up. Um, so this question from an anonymous uh, attendee says, you storing the videos for subsequent review, which I think you, you said you are, or, but is there an aspect of real-time analysis as well? Uh, yeah, that's again, that comes down to the task. So if, if we're looking at, at a, at a um, maybe a, a close-up inspection of, of a certain asset, um, in some instances, uh, the drone operator will be in the field together with an engineer um, and and they will they will look at at what they are what they're collecting and going oh this needs to be fixed here and now or this can wait so so that there there is there is real time use of the data but again it comes down to the task. Brilliant. A uh, couple of questions from Sarah Fox here. Um, I'm just going to go through these hopefully in order um, and we'll uh, we'll get through them. So if you can answer this one, so uh, can you provide any update please as to the position of um, 
global navigation satellite systems will be using uh, since we left the EU and of course access to the GNN. Uh, are there any risks for the UK um, for, in terms of that, if that's something you're able to answer? Um, I have not seen any change since we, we've left the, the EU. Um, we don't have any, uh, there hasn't been any negative impact uh, on, on how we are using uh, either our drones or our, our helicopters. Um, so so I, I would say, I, I, to my knowledge, there, there are no um, negative influences on that. Brilliant. Um, uh, next one then. So, so drones have a, a visual and thermal capabilities, but are there some inspections uh, that will always need the human eye? Uh, I think I know the answer, but what do you think? Oh, that's uh, that, that's not for me to answer. That's an engineering question because I'm not an engineer. I, I can tell you what, what what we can use drones for today. But as I said, we are developing use cases um, almost daily as, as we're exploring new areas within our industry. Um, I'm sure there will always be places where, where you'd like to have a human eye on. But again, the drone can still be um, the tool that gives you that that ability. We've got something called red zones um, within the, the um, rail industry, and that's places where we do not allow humans to go in because we deem it too dangerous. Um, with drones, we can actually get an eye in there and see what's going on. Um, and that has been a first in a, in a couple of places around the country, which has been really exciting. Um, but um, a true answer to that is an engineering answer. I'm sorry, I can't provide that. No worries, thank you. Uh Question for, you, for Jan. So um, what's the advanced time notice on the platform, uh, i.e., you know, 10 minutes before the flight, one day before the flight? Interesting question. What uh, advanced time no notice? Uh, I'm not, not sure what, exactly what we mean by advanced, advanced time notice. I, I, what, what I can say is that um, in terms of, uh, let's say, pre-flight planning, um, currently the platform um, allows uh, flights to be planned up to 14 days um, in advance of, uh, of, of a, a, a flight uh, takeoff, should we say. Um, um, and then uh, um, at the point of, uh, of, 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 of takeoff, um, the, 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 op the operators can, uh, well, in fact, we've just demonstrated on, a, um, on, 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 just completed a future flight phase two project um, where we demonstrated the link um, between drone cloud and uh, air traffic control. Um, so that was uh, um, that, so in, in that context, um, operators can request uh, to take off, um, and that's effectively in real time. So um, you know, they, they can request to take off and then get uh, a response from air traffic control in near real time. Um, it, it, that is, uh, is is based around uh, let's say live telemetry um, and a live communication between drone cloud and um, enabled uh, GCSs, which is, uh, again, effectively near real time. So I think we're talking about um, uh, you know, sub one second uh, um, communication. If that answers the question, but I wasn't quite sure whether I'd phrase the answer correctly. That's fine. Hope, hopefully, hopefully that's uh, around the right line. So um, next question uh, again, again, Jan. So have any other utilities um, been, been taking up um, Drone Cloud? Um, any examples of these, which sectors? <coughs> Yes, um, so we, we we have some interest. Uh, um, uh, I, I need to be careful what, what, what I say, but we, we certainly have some interest from uh, other um, uh, utilities who might be managing um, uh, very large linear um, assets uh, in the UK um, and, uh, and 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 other regions. Um, uh, and and we've also, uh, we also we're also doing uh, some some work with uh, um, energy companies uh, so looking at uh, inspections of uh, um, power lines um, and also um, in the uh, um, oil and gas sector as well so I guess yeah, I mean the answer is yes we, we've got a number of other utilities um, uh, using the using the platform um, in both in the UK and, uh, and and internationally brilliant thank you uh, I'll pick a few more um, and then we, we might have to move on um, but it's great that we've got so many um, so this one's um, for you, Ricky. So thanks for a great presentation. Uh, could you take us through the regulatory approval process you had to go to through to enable the 25 kilometer BB loss Nadir flight, uh, as well as the systems used to demonstrate the detect and avoid capability? 
uh, we don't have time to go through the whole process. <laughs> it, it took a long time, um, but but we did what what everybody else does, and 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 that's that's um, that's putting in a, a, an operational safety case uh, with the CAA and uh, and going through the the rigmarole of, of being. Uh, having the paperwork scrutinized um, several times and coming back and needing to 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 redo certain things and applying again, um, and then we went through the um, the rather lengthy um, approval um, route for uh, a TDA, um, which took a, a lot longer than than expected. If I if I'm honest um, to say, um, the overall um timeline and i'm trying to count here now was probably about 18 months from from we, we started until we we actually um uh, had our had our bb loss flight in october last year um so quite a lengthy uh, process um and obviously not anything that is commercially viable uh, and something that you can roll out and and have as as a, as a business as usual um, but um, we are we are we are speaking to the CAA and hopefully being able to to, to help um, um, in, in streamlining the process and 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 for, for everybody to get more comfortable with with introducing these kind of, of flights into the um, into the airspace. Brilliant. Um, and just a couple more. So uh, this one's from Midi to to Ricky. Um, so she noticed an image of a Hermes 900 on, on Ricky's presentation. And what's your yeah. current thinking on large thick wing systems like this um i'm very excited systems. by them um and uh, and and i think that they potentially have a, a place um not for tomorrow and not for next year um but again part of, of what i do is try to look 5 10 20 years um out in 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 space and sometimes uh, the crystal ball became becomes a little bit blurry on around the edges but um, I'm definitely uh, looking into larger uh, drones, drones that flies higher and that potentially can give us a different capability than, than small, more mobile and nimble um, drones that are flying uh, closer to the ground can. Brilliant. And just one more for Jan. I'm going to roll two questions into one here. So both slightly more technical, but uh, is there an API um, to allow third party systems to connect and submit flights um, and over flight requests? Um, and, and do you offer kind of flight logging and integration with air data? So I suppose it's it, it's really an overarching yeah. point about how easy it is to 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 you work with other systems. I suppose. Yeah. So so so. Okay. I'll I'll I'll, I'll tackle that. Just actually, just before before I do, um, I just uh, I, was, I was rereading that other question about the the, the the time scale. So I think if I've understood that, just just to um, correct myself on, on that, I think the, the 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 question was more around the notification system. So. It, um, Submitting a notification to, to, to Network Rail, um, and and that is uh, is effectively instantaneous. So as I said, can be done up to uh, fourteen days in advance, um, but uh, um, it can be done literally up to the point um, when you're flying. Um, so uh, yeah, R Ricky, jump jump in if uh, if you've got any kind of disagreement on that. But effectively, people can uh, submit their uh, requests to or, or notifications to NR. Um, uh, and and that and that will be processed immediately. Only if uh, Network Rail have an issue with it, will they will they get back to you. So uh, you don't need to wait for approval or anything. It's just a notification system. Uh, so that's that's a um, just an update on that one. So in terms of the API question, we do, uh, but they're currently being used in our um, uh, future flight uh, and projects. So they're, they're, they're they should we say more in the um, uh, R and D. Uh, so I think, but we are looking to roll those out into a um, in, in, into a commercial service uh, um, very shortly. Um, we, we just uh, um, let's say finalising some stuff on the uh, on the R and D front. Um, and in terms of uh, um, we we don't uh, currently offer integration to air data, um, but what we what we are um, so we got our own um, let's say flight logging uh, um, solution. Uh, but we we are currently also um, we're, we're in fact just finalising uh, the deployment uh, internally uh, for testing of a an integration with a DJI. So it'll effectively um, automatically pull in uh, um, flight logs um, and 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 effectively do a very sim similar thing. Brilliant. Well, thank you both so much for um, for presenting and answering those questions. And um, we've. I think we've got more questions that are in the chat and the Q and A box. So, so I mean, if you, if you um, if you want to go through and, and type any answers, or I'm sure you'd be happy for people to to kind of reach out um, if they've got specific questions. Um, but it's been great to hear from you both. So, thank you. 
My pleasure. Um, pleasure. Thanks, guys. Okay, so we're going to um, move on to the next section of the uh, presentation today, and we'll be hearing um, from Ed. And I think Ed's going to be sharing his own slides, which is why they've disappeared temporarily. Um, so, Ed, if you want to come on um, and uh, share your screen, and then um, we'll hear from them about their drone in the box systems. Great, thanks very much. Uh, just trying to share. Uh, oh, sorry, just give me a second. No worries. Uh, and try that again. All right. I hope you can all uh, see my screen. Yep, we can see that and we can hear you fine. So go right ahead. Great. All right. Well, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. My name is Edward Anastaskis. I'm the CEO of Herotech 8. Oh, we can't uh, see your video, though, Ed, if you've oh, got sorry. your camera on. Yeah. Give me one second. There we go. How's That's that? All. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks. Great. Um, it's a full screen. Uh, so my name is Edward Anastaskis. I'm the CEO of Herotech Gate. Uh, very pleased to be presenting uh, here at Tech 8 today. Uh, so throughout the presentation, I'm really just going to be discussing uh, a little bit about who we are, what we do, uh, the technology we build today, some of our applications and use cases, uh, and then uh, what we aim to do tomorrow, uh, what we think the future holds for the drone industry and how we sort of fit into that. So first, a little bit about here at Tech 8. So we're a robotics company. And we are based over, uh, we're HQ'd in Cranfield. Um, we also have a, a couple of other satellite offices, uh, one in Berkeley, California, that does some R&D uh, and fundraising activities. But for the form, you know, for the for the most part, we are based here uh, in the UK. Now, the original aim for the company was to look at mechanisms to remove uh, operators from being on site, uh, reduce the dependencies of, of sort of on site pilots um to conduct you know things like airworthiness checks you know drone checks uh, system checks environment checks and so on uh, we wanted to really have the ability to leave a permanently deployed drone uh, out on a site and then call it out for use really whenever uh whenever we wanted from wherever we were from from wherever we were uh and hence you know this concept of automated drone stations or drone in a box systems sort of uh, uh you know sort of emerged and so over the past few years, we've, um, especially with the impact of COVID-19, uh, we've worked really hard uh, and leveraged a tremendous amount of IoT technologies into our uh, systems and our services. Um, the, the goal really being an ability to control over the internet from wherever you are, that teleoperation uh, goal. Uh, and all of this, <clears throat> I mean, I won't go into too much detail about the tech yet, uh, but the major two work streams that we've been working on really are end-to-end uh, -end automation uh, from the flight request to the mission planning and uh, and all the way down to the charging, uploading of data <clears throat> to the teleoperation uh, part of it. So secure remote access and control. So like I said, uh, we are a robotics and engineering company. Uh, our activities include a huge amount of research and development. We participate in a large number of Innovate UK projects, also DSTL research projects. And some of these projects involve our hardware being repurposed uh, or uh, applied to parallel use cases that we have seen gain some traction. Things like drone medical deliveries, uh, applying our technology for takeoff and landing on moving vehicles, uh, even the miniaturization of our tech uh, to be used indoor for facility, uh, facility monitoring and surveying. Now, naturally, uh, we are becoming more of a manufacturer now. We build and run an assembly line straight out of Cranfield. Uh, where we obviously conduct a good number of probably our system. And for our customers, we usually conduct uh, additional services like the installation, the training, the maintenance services. And we even provide over-the-air updates to our customers, providing them with new, uh, new and emerging features as we mature the system over time. And lastly, I'm sure I'll get quite a few questions about this later, but we provide our customers with a strong amount of support regarding the regulatory challenges facing the adoption of this technology. Many of you will have heard of things like SORA, uh, Specific Operations Risk Assessment Methodology. Uh, we've worked with a number of customers all around the world uh, to deliver <clears throat> safety cases based on SORA uh, to uh, make sure that they can fully capitalize on this type of technology 
And uh, this is a service that we, we expect to fulfill for the majority of our customers today. And I'll talk a little bit more about one specific uh, use case and one specific BB loss exemption that we have operating. <clears throat> so the driver behind building our automated drone station was really that uh, we saw that drones had a huge potential uh, across across many industries. Uh, it's part of that, I guess, industry 4.0 revolution built around robotics, automation, and data. But it's tapped into that vertical dimension that allows us to, to really do incredible things with that aerial perspective. <clears throat> and now, whilst I say all these good things about drone services and the use of drone technology, it's not actually that often when we look outside, we see drones conducting work. Now, ultimately, we started here at Tech Aid because we thought there was space for this kind of drone infrastructure technology to enable drones to be used a lot more, to be much more accessible, to do a lot more work and provide greater value. Now, these days, there's a growing demand for drone services. However, there are still a number of challenges. Um, it can still be cost prohibitive. They can still uh, require training, but you know, sorry, we can still see a training burden on, on the site managers or, uh, or, or within the use cases where a pilot is required. Uh, there's problems with site restrictions, logistical burdens, uh, challenges for getting visitor access onto premises, especially today with uh, COVID-19. And this growing demand coupled with the personnel related challenges uh, makes the current sort of operator centric uh, operation really quite ripe for automation. And that's where we sit. Our goal is to deliver ubiquitous drone services throughout, uh, sorry, through automated technologies. So I'll just play a quick video that shows our technology. Connected Places Catapult are the UK's innovation accelerator for cities, transport and places. As part of the DFT funded Drone Pathfinder Catalyst program, we're here today with Hero Tech 8, who are a UK based provider of automated drone solutions. With the help of their industry partners, we're showcasing how these solutions can be used across UK sectors to drive productivity and safety benefits. So Hero Tech 8 is a robotic startup coming out of Cranfield University. Um, we are a developer and manufacturer of automated drone stations, also known as drone on a box. Um, we take a third party drone into our box uh, and our box contains our guidance systems, our power systems, our navigation systems, and most importantly, our communication systems. So the key capability behind our technology, it's really there to enable businesses to deploy drone services without needing personnel on site. We're really looking at the opportunity where one person can claim responsibility for operating multiple of the systems at once. Uh, this is where the major cost saving potential is. While implementing these solutions across the UK is an iterative process, there are some really compelling applications that are already seeing adoption. These are the applications that see the benefit of the improved operational efficiency and responsiveness that automation brings. DroneCloud is an integrated software as a service platform, but our customers share some core problems. How do we use drones to gather data faster and more safely, and sometimes in ways that traditional methods just don't allow? The evolving technology and regulation means that new uses are opening up rapidly. We see drones in a box as a driving force for our industry's growth. Really, you can think of a drone in a box as a mini airport or hub. If you start to think of multiple hubs working together, you can quickly see how more complex operations become possible at scale. Our core organisation aim is the safe decommissioning of the legacy Magnox nuclear power stations in the UK. We see the drone in a box as one solution in managing the safety of our assets through the use of routine condition monitoring. The benefits of drone automation to Magnox are that we can eliminate the need for a pilot to be on a site at any particular time when the inspection is required. We have 12 sites over the UK and limited piloting resource and therefore this enables us to respond more rapidly to events, saving cost and minimising risks. The UK is on a journey towards unlocking the benefits from automated solutions like drone in a box. To find out more about how these technologies can support your organisation, please get in touch. Sorry, Ed, you're on mute.
Oh, all right. Let's try again. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about the technology, the uh, provide an overview of the automated drone station uh, that we've built today and deployed. Um, so at a fundamental level, we have the drone station itself. It's comprised of a third party drone. Now we don't build the drones ourselves. We take the best that the market has to offer. Uh, and then we integrate this drone into the, into the station. Inside a station, we have things like the guidance navigation system, the charging and power systems, even drone inspection cameras to determine if the drone is airworthy. Uh, this has been quite important. And we also have auxiliary ports to enable a host of additional subsystems, things like uh, UPS systems, weather stations, tracking antennas. We even now uh, have uh, drone tracking antenna, uh, sorry, drone tracking cameras. So it's quite a flexible piece of kit. Now on the top, we have our, our communication module. Uh, that's that item on the left there. <clears throat> now this is actually a, a, a crucial piece of technology as it connects our drone station to the broader network. Uh, this is what enables you to connect the drone station to the internet, for example. Now it also contains the interface to program uh, specific fail safes. <clears throat> so fail safes also include things like kill switches. Uh, so uh, disarming the drone while it's flying for safety purposes or things like parachutes. Uh, now we connect this drone uh, module to a wider network and this can be private or public uh, public as in the internet and in the case of private networks we would need to then install uh, sort of the cloud services onto customers existing it infrastructure however in all cases really um, <clears throat> excuse me uh, in all cases really a uh, command and control video streaming media management and flight log data is exchanged with our cloud service now to fly the system <clears throat> you can connect uh, to the cloud service and operate using uh, a piece of software called the ground control station. In fact, we enable multiple end users to dial in and view the operation all at the same time, all via just a regular internet browser window. And lastly, we also uh, enable um, customers, some customers to connect multiple drone stations to that same cloud service. Uh, so they can manage multiple flights, even multiple flights concurrently We've also, uh, in the past, demonstrated that we can have networks of drone systems with each drone flying from one station to another, and then another, and then another, all recharging and uploading data whilst within, uh, whilst within the station. So to summarize, uh, we, we're really using very low latency video for our teleoperations. We've made, a, made this a huge emphasis of our, uh, of our technology. We've flown drones overseas from our offices here at Cranfield and have had lots of other companies overseas fly our systems at Cranfield. The latency has always been a challenge in the past in creating safety processes to account for um, high latency expectations is an area, oh, sorry, exceptions is an area that we expect to continue to further develop. Managing, for example, the bandwidth of five high definition video streams all coming in from different parts of the world is very challenging, but certainly feasible with today's technology. Now internally, our record uh, for supervised fleet management from a single operator, that is one operator to many drone operations, uh, is about five. Uh, this was not due to technology limitations, but really due to what we term operator bandwidth. Uh, so operators really struggle to simultaneously control multiple systems without support from additional software, uh, things like our team working, uh, team working algorithms. And media management, all media is uploaded to the cloud uh, on landing or charging. I uh, can't emphasize this enough. People really do ask this question all the time. Uh, you don't need to physically get the data from the drone uh, when it's in the station. That physical interaction would effectively defeat the purpose uh, of that platform. Uh, and configurable safety policies. Um, you can restrict what certain users can and cannot do uh, when they connect to the system. Some users are provided with sort of super admin or super user control. Some can create and store missions. Some users can see the video feedback but can't actually fly it. And some users can only review uh, captured media. So my last note on this is that, actually following that question in, uh, on the previous slide, um, we have developed APIs that allow us to share the data, uh, sometimes with directly with external software platforms. Uh, security is a good, use uh, good example here. We've been integrating with a number of security systems, uh, video management systems, to enable security personnel to remotely view drone camera feeds and dispatch drones from within their uh, existing software platforms, but also the data analytics platforms. Today, there are plenty of them uh, often being used in things like construction, mining, and so on. Uh, we've been developing our software such that we can directly forward this captured drone data to these, to these data services. 
<clears throat> so uh, moving over to some of our applications, there are three key considerations to make when looking to employ an automated drone station. So the question really is, what, when does it make sense to use a drone station? The first is the remoteness or, well, the location. So the remoteness and accessibility of the, of the facility or the asset that you are sort of deploying on. How costly is it to get onto premise and return? The more challenging this is, the more costly this is, the more it makes sense to have a permanently deployed solution on premise uh, and operate from somewhere much more suitable uh, for, the, uh, for the pilot team. Now this is then coupled with relevant uh, flight frequency. So how often does one need or want to fly uh, to capture data? Uh, security is a, for example, a 24 seven responsibility and many of our customers uh, ask for perimeter patrols to be conducted in a way that mirrors how frequently uh, security guards on the ground conduct their patrols. Often you will see, some, uh, see things like every three hours, one drone needs to be in the air uh, and you know, done over many weeks. This is actually a very, high frequency operation. Uh, and it makes sense here uh, to use an automated drone station. Some other sectors, however, could also benefit from daily flights uh, or even, even weekly. However, the fewer flights required, the lower the returns are to that end user. Now, the final driver uh, is the response times required to have a drone airborne. Uh, this is particularly useful for things like emergency, uh, emergency services, which benefit greatly from having you know, eyes in the sky as soon as they've hit, uh, got an incident reported. <clears throat> so as you can see, uh, the use cases for drone stations uh, or drone on a box technology is really quite broad. And I've broken it down into two applications, security and surveillance, and increasingly facility asset management. Uh, so the continuous, the routine inspection and monitoring uh, of a infrastructure asset or warehouses or something like this. Now I've listed a number of key applications and use cases here uh, with security and surveillance being key, but here you see sort of the market verticals that, that we are now sort of present on or have had a lot of experience uh, working within. Uh, if, if you don't see yourself on this list for sure, uh, please reach out because the application uh, range is quite, quite broad. So I'll just quickly catch you through some of our use cases that I hope will, will resonate with some of you in the audience. Um, the first is, uh, one vaccine manufacturing plant. So we've uh, effectively given the system to uh, a security team at a vaccine manufacturing plant. And that drone is continuously flying, uh, capturing video and imagery of the perimeter. The perimeter is a very inaccessible sort of perimeter. Um, we do routine rooftop inspections now as well. So the more the security teams have actually been using it, the more uh, interested facility management teams have become and have developed lots of use cases like storm uh, storm damage assessments um, across this sort of old piece of legacy infrastructure. And here we see improvements in time safety, uh, safety for building inspections. Uh, we've also integrated this system with their IT infrastructure. Substation monitoring is another example. <clears throat> uh, facility and asset monitoring of power distribution networks. Uh, it's close up thermal inspections of transformers. Uh, and lines uh, really increasingly routine flights around nearby power line assets as well. Uh, here, it's very similar to the previous slide. Uh, improved time or reduced uh, inspection times, improved safety, uh, no entirely remote operations, so no associated logistics. That's been very, very promising because uh, power stations are really distributed across the whole country. Um, and increasing, uh, and we've also managed to increase the number of inspections Per, uh, per asset, uh, providing the uh, end user or the client with more informative data uh, to improve asset maintenance schedule. So in construction, uh, now we've, we've not done a huge amount of construction work, but we are getting into it and it is, it is a very exciting sector to be in. Um, I mean, some of the use cases for construction are listed here, site monitoring, ortho mosaics, and volumetrics. Uh, here you see coupled with some of the data analytics providers as well, there's an opportunity there. Uh, construction progress monitoring, marketing footage, uh, remote specialist planning. <clears throat> and one of, one of the major benefits really is you can conduct repeatable flights uh, on a continuous basis. <clears throat> now, something that I wanted to talk to you about uh, quickly was our EDF use case. So um, EDF currently deploys a number of systems to conduct aerial security across the power plant that, uh, that uh, we operate on. So the fence line here is actually very long. It's very expensive, uh, spanning a number of kilometers, uh, much of which really is very inaccessible and it's very difficult to secure with just cameras. Uh, each system is dispatched, uh, so multiple systems on the site, 
uh, each system is dispatched to conduct perimeter patrols across the facility every couple of hours. <clears throat> um, uh, especially at night where visibility from the ground is, is quite poor. And now there's a good reason for having a number of systems operating at once uh, or in, in tandem. The obvious reason is of course redundancy. Uh, so if the system is unavailable, uh, you could dispatch the other. The systems are also able to tag team between each other so that one system goes up uh, and when it returns for recharging the other one, then it can be dispatched to take over. And finally, the systems can also be simultaneously dispatched to cover greater ground more quickly in the case of an incident. Now, just to note our BB loss exemption here, uh, Heritage Gate has worked with EDF and the regulator to secure significant operating privileges. Now, in this case, the security guards are already in their control rooms. Um, uh, so, you know, they're, they're already beyond you know, operating beyond visual line of sight. They don't see, they don't physically see the drone flying. However, what is significant is that the security guards are not certified pilots. There's no PFCO, there's no GVC or A2CFC. They just have Heritage Gate training. And this is a huge achievement because it really does <clears throat> um, show the scalability of the technology with this approach. Now, last uh, use case, and uh, I'll bring Ian in immediately after, uh, just to sort of walk through uh, the strategy behind nuclear decommissioning. Um, but just to point out, we work uh, we work uh, quite closely with Magnox, uh, with units on premise, <clears throat> and here it's you know big legacy infrastructure uh, that where inspections are required very routinely. Uh, drone services have already made it very very uh, I guess easy to access remote parts or inaccessible areas of that uh, of their facilities, but they have a large number of sites with very uh, sort of constrained resources in order to conduct these inspections. Uh, and here, the drone in a box plays a key role. You can put drone in a boxes on these premises and then control them from really wherever you are. Uh, and with that, I'd love to bring in uh, Ian Henderson. So he's he's a co-author of the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority Drone Strategy Report uh, and has a wealth of experience also both with our systems, but but within the drone space as a whole. Uh, so I'll just pass over to uh, to Ian. Thank you, Ed. And, uh, it's been an interesting program so far. And uh, but I just wanted just to um, just for a, a purpose of clarity, really, just to go through a little uh, disclaimer. Um, I noticed on the program, it had uh, myself down as uh, Ian Henderson, director Magnox. Uh, for any misunderstanding, I'm not a director of Magnox. Um, Magnox is one of my clients. So currently I act as uh, subject matter specialist an advisor to Magnox, and also at the time that Ed and I met, I was a UAV lead uh, at Sellafield Sites up in Cumbria. Um, so just a little clarification on that. Um, <coughs> Sellafield, NDA and Magnox are actually my clients where I uh, basically um, work with them in a supportive advisory role. So I thought I'd just clear that up straight away. For any, in case you've got any misunderstanding. So it's, I was thinking actually about the whole process from beginning to end on how uh, you are, yes, or our past, or all the names that we've had over the years, how it comes to be an industry. Because industry actually is the bigger challenge. Uh, when DJI started making their material, it was just for the consumer. Then they started thinking about industry. But my focus has always been in industry. And how does industry take the technology and how does it deploy it and integrate it into its business systems? Well, there was a, an old Roman philosopher that once said that if a captain of a sailing ship doesn't know, doesn't know which port he's heading for, then no wind is a good wind. So in other words, what he's saying is, unless you've got a clear objective, then you better not go anywhere. But I just wonder how many large operations, and there are a few today that have, but I just wonder how many have a UAS or drone strategy in their business. Well, I'm, to, I'm pleased actually to be involved in developing such a strategy with the nuclear industry and the implementation of automated flight systems into plant operations is just part of that deliverable. So, if you think about quite a while ago, I spoke to the Environment Agency about uh, drone strategy and 
they said that they didn't have anything so, so grand. Uh, <coughs> the time there was Haddock, but obviously, if you look at the EA now, their development is well ahead and uh, is becoming part of their business model. But usually, though, the use of drone technology and methodology is at best Haddock, with little or to no joined up thinkings in the business, perhaps seen as a nice to have but not critical to business success. But I believe it's a very, very, very important first step. So without clear direction, it would be a challenge for all the departments in a business to get behind the programme. And that was the case here with Magnox, and it certainly was the case up at Sellafield. Both site li licensed companies needed to think about um, a number of questions before signing off a business case. And I, I want to draw your attention to this just to show you the journey and where we are in the, with regarding to significant change in culture and attitude. So you think about some of the questions that they would need to sit down and ask. One of them might be, what are, what are the drivers for the program? You know, why do we need to do this? Is this cost driven? Is this risk reduction? Is this security based? What's the reason? What's the driver? That was the first question. And then if we were to implement a, a, a model, what, what would that be? What, what would be the operation model? Of? And then if we were to have an in-house team, as opposed to buying that resource in, um, how would these remote pilots keep current, especially if they were operating, for instance, a dive team model? And would there need to be competency-based training, ongoing training? Who will deliver this? Is this an in-house trainer or this is an external support? And will the software we invest in and the data from this software be usable by other business packages? That's a serious consideration. Who will maintain the equipment? What spares will we keep? Where will the equipment be stored? Is there a process for dealing with contaminated equipment? Do we have a disposal route? What type of booking in and out system will we use? What's the investment plan to keep our equipment current and who will be the accountable manager and if we've picked somebody within the business to be the accountable manager are they swept are they suitably qualified and an experienced person for this role do we want more automation and use artificial intelligence where possible for data analysis and will there be a need for beyond visual line of sight or extended visual line of sight or just visual line of sight and how will we manage the data gathered? Where and how will we store it? And who will ensure cybersecurity? These are all things that we had to discuss as part of that strategy. The list isn't exhaustive, by the way. It's just indicative of the discussions we needed to go through in order to invite people like Edward and his team uh, to the party. But it was clear from our findings that both companies had a need for automated flight systems because it dovetailed nicely with the company's prime mission, and that's the decommissioning of hazardous sites, reducing the risk to operatives and ramp, ramping up the rate of decommissioning whilst providing some financial headroom. But if you look at the context then, you, know, you look at the background of the industry. Now, some of you out there might be saying, well, that's a given, you know, what you've just discussed, we all have to do that if we're looking to build a program. And so no surprises there. But when you put this into context and understand how risk averse the industry is and was, well, it was the fact that anything new onto any plant is very often viewed with uh, suspicion and risk, especially if it's cutting edge. They always tend to go for, well, it's proven, it's always worked, so we'll stick with it. So when you just think about that and think about actually now we're flying UAS or drones inside the security fence, just the thought of it back then would have frightened many people. Now we're actually doing it. What a culture change that, that's taken to now accept technology and automated or semi-automated flights, whereas only, what, five years ago, they would have struggled just to accept the idea. And that's why I think what uh, Heretech and Edward have done is truly remarkable. 
in to have their first system installed at Albury uh, inside the security fence. There has not been another company in the UK that I'm aware of. And I, I know all 12 sites within Magnox and the <coughs> site Sellafield. So that's significant. Why did we think about this? What was the benefits for this type of automated strategy? How would it help the business case? Well, quite simply, resource augmentation is one of those. So all, as sites aim to reduce their headcount, they still need to fulfill their site license conditions uh, regarding security and asset inspection. We can do this with an automated system. And of course, we have repetitive tasks. And some of these tasks are in high hazard areas. And do we, keep, do we need to put people at risk? Or could we do this uh, or, 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 or using autonomous systems? And uh, you know, three o'clock tomorrow, it goes and have a look, get the data, come back, download it, and does that every day. <coughs> So these repetitive jobs, well, then we can free up resource to do other more critical things. So automated workflows, uh, work, work output, process and procedures designed to increase operational efficiency and drive down associated costs. Uh, reduction of associated with uh, conventional risk in travel. People don't have to travel across multiple sites because if you've got the systems installed, then technically we can operate that from the office. And of course, reduction of site visits associated with contracting remote pilots, because this eases the vetting of procedures that we have to work through. And of course, standardization of equipment. But it doesn't come without its negatives. We've had to think about these challenges. So we know a lot of systems now are GPS reliant. Well, on virtually every site that I know, we have GPS gray areas where unfortunately we have issues with uh, with, with, with systems relying on GPS. So that's where the, the business and the strategy needs to get behind the R&D to enable us to still use these systems with, perhaps without being reliant on GPS satellites, perhaps it may be a local system. And of course, finally, we can't leave a discussion without perception, to understand perception. So the current feeling among some individuals and groups is that these systems will remove jobs and therefore they're viewed as a threat. And because they're, they're viewed as a threat, you hit resistance when trying to build a program. They don't want to work with you. They're, it's a bit treacly because they feel that this will take away their jobs. So education is required to eliminate the threat, but it's something we can't ignore. So where do we go? What's next? Well, I think in the past in the nuclear industry, was seen as the cutting edge and, and certainly leading the world in scientific and technological breakthrough. But over time, it's had its own challenges, as you are well aware, and not always came off smelling of roses uh, and received uh, quite some bad press. But we're at the beginning of a new chapter with regard to how this country, and in fact the world, produces its energy. Could we dare to dream? Could we see the industry at the cutting edge yet again, but for another reason? Could, could it be that the nuclear industry leads the way in, in getting behind research and development on connected systems and then use these systems in the daily operation, embedded artificial intelligence systems? Could we see autonomous AI-driven connected systems that patrol the security perimeter, augmenting current security processes? Could we see swarms of micro drones gathering critical information from the bowels of legacy buildings, high hazard buildings, passing their captured data back to a central hub where it's analyzed using algorithms to help us humans underpin good decision making, capitalizing on radiation protection principles of time and distance? Could we see civil systems engineers using cutting edge technology on a daily basis? using automated data analysis to identify faults, connected processes that eliminate the risk of human factors and maximize the number crunching efficiency of computers. Well, yes, we could see all of these and more, so long as we have an integrated drone strategy in our industry and in our business. As that old Roman philosopher 
once said, if the captain of a sailing ship does not know which port he's heading for, then no wind is a good wind. So I'm pleased that we've, uh, Edward and I met up uh, many years ago through a connection, and I'm pleased the progress that's been made because it's certainly advanced the nuclear industry into the next generation <coughs> and challenged a good few paradigms. Great, thanks very much. Uh, that was a really good overview of I think, the status of the industry and how we take it forward. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the general observation uh, or at least Heritage's general observation when it comes to drones. Uh, that one is limited to only flying BV, uh, to, oh, sorry, there's some confusion here with the, yeah, sorry, there's a issue with the slides, sorry for this. But there's a general observation when it comes to drones that one is limited to only uh, flying within visual line of sight, uh, that is typically flying up to 500 meters uh, from the remote pilot, typically, not always. And the industry has been clamoring for more, of course. Operators want to be able to fly BV loss, uh, which often means flying further in order to reduce, reduce costs. Covering greater ground with the drone provides the client with major cost efficiencies. Um, <clears throat> as we move beyond this limit, we begin to observe that these operations, they become more and more complicated, uh, more and more complex, and require a host of risk mitigation methods um, in order to assure safety and so on. Now, before going into too much detail here, I just want to quickly break down the different layers of BV loss to show you how we think we are going to get there. Now, we approach this in a sort of step-by-step -step manner, uh, with each layer being increasingly complex, uh, though, again, this is where we gain at each step uh, great cost-saving potential. Now, the first step is what we call a supervised one-to-one -one BV loss. This refers to a remote pilot operating a single drone at a single time uh, beyond, uh, beyond visual line of sight monitoring the drone's behavior through its video feed and controlling the drone through conventional uh, control systems like our ground control, ground control station. Now the next uh, stepping stone is what we call a supervised one to, one to X, one to many um, BV loss. And this refers to, I think I spoke about it before, it's referring to one remote pilot controlling many live drone systems at once. To get to this point, you really need to demonstrate that the one to one uh, works best, it's satisfactory, and that we are able to uh, also consider things like the attentiveness of the pilot managing multiple systems, including ensuring deconfliction between each of these drones. Now, automation here is really, really very key. Even when multiple pilots operate in the same area, uh, they will need to constantly communicate and deconflict with one another. Now, automation will enable systems to immediately react and ensure that drones are appropriately separated and operating safely. And finally, sort of the, the holy grail, what is termed uh, unsupervised BV loss or uh, what we call fly and forget. Um, ultimately, this is where you are able to select a mission on the GCS and just press go. You're then free to grab a coffee uh, or focus on a separate task at hand. You are not needed to monitor the flight and will only return to collect and analyze the captured data. This is what we mean by uh, unsupervised and the cost saving potential here really is huge and it's what the drone industry is striving to deliver. Now, currently, the industry as a whole, it sits in that orange box. Um, but there are many programs of work, uh, like the Future Flight uh, Phase 3 Innovate UK initiative, uh, are looking to enable these kinds of BV loss flights and accelerate our journey over to the unsupervised BV loss piece. Now, Heritage Age roadmap is very much dictated according to this. So going quickly back uh, through the objectives for the technology at the start, we're looking to make drone services ubiquitous across sectors by making them as accessible, as easy to use as possible. Now we now have automated drone uh, technologies, which is what you see in that uh, hexagon. And we are developing a means of unlocking op new operational authorizations to fly BV loss, for example. We believe that a key missing component to making drone services ubiquitous is that on demand or as a service business model where customers can request drone inspections from their phones or from their computers as and when they need it. And we call our version of this uh, open air. So put plainly, uh, open air is a drone hailing service that is already live. It's being matured at Cranfield. Um, drone stations are network, networked across the area and users are able to log onto the platform, request and schedule drone flights. 
When required, the nearest and most available drone is then dispatched by a remote pilot to fulfill the request for, say, under 50 pounds. And this is a fraction of what traditional drone services cost today. You are not exposed to the burden of procurement, training, maintenance, insurance, and so on. Once that drone has streamed and captured that data you have requested, it's then shared with you online to use as you wish. Now, the nature of the service is really quite broad. We are running flights for things like facility management, agricultural use cases currently, uh, but we're also now uh, growing this to include security flights as well, which are required uh, daily. And we see broad applicability for this style of service for things like construction infrastructure, industrial uh, facility monitoring, and even emergency services where emergency response teams can simply provide a priority request where the drone is then dispatched to respond to that incident. I hope that was clear. <clears throat> now, uh, the final piece and sort of all to tie it close together, this open air service, it really capitalizes on a, on a number of things and a number of emerging capabilities. The first is of course, this ability to book a drone. Uh, you can book a drone for a specific application. You can request a flight path specific to your needs. Uh, and within uh, an hour or within that operating window you have requested, uh, that drone will be dispatched there. Uh, and you'll be charged according to the amount of data that you capture, but also uh, the availability of that drone. Media capture, of course, all that media can be downloaded uh, to the cloud and will made available only to uh, the individual that's requested those flights. And finally, once that data is there uh, and in the hands of the client, they can then elect to pr process this data. Things like digital twins are quite uh, are quite significant. Um, things like orthomosaics and, and, and many other uh, analytics softwares exist where we can then pipe that uh, information captured directly to them. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, I hope this was uh, was useful for everybody. I hope this is of interest. Uh, any questions, please throw them into the chat and I'm happy to do my best and respond to them. Thanks very much. Great, thanks both of you. Um, really interesting talks there. Um, we've got some great questions coming through as well. Um, we, uh, we've got about 15 minutes to address those. So if there are any more, uh, keep on firing them in um, and we'll try and get through them all. Um, so starting from the top, um, Question for Herotech. Utilizing drone in a box, would be would it be possible to fly a drone between different boxes for extended range? Or does it have a seamless transition from one manager for one manager to handle? I'm going to do my best to answer this concisely. Um, so yes, we have done uh, a number of flights, uh, albeit in a research and development context, where we have already flown our existing systems from one box to another. Um, the consideration about extending the range, uh, absolutely. This is this is something uh, that is possible. However, it adds to that complexity dimension of the operation. When you fly one drone from one station to another, at least the current systems that we have, not all of them, we have emerging uh, upcoming products that hopefully will be able to address the issue, uh, but you're limited, you're confined to the transmission range of that, or the transmission limitations of the of the drone that's flying uh, so communications when we have experimented with what we call a hub and spoke model where a drone will fly take off from a hub to a spoke that allows it to recharge and then fly on from that uh, we've seen a host of new challenges to address uh, the biggest being uh, communications um, yes te technically it's possible uh, we need a lot more development there to i think cement down on that great thank you Next question then, um, how are your solutions handling detect and avoid with other airspace users, uh, both piloted and unpiloted? How will this scale uh, when airspace usage increases in the future? This is a really good question. Now we have a number of uh, both research projects, but also commercial integration uh, activities uh, with other providers of detect and avoid uh, solutions. So we, we don't actually build um, detect and avoid solutions. They are, there's a whole host of uh, you know, industry partners that are aggressively trying to tackle this problem. Innovate UK is maybe the best place where you see this. Uh, DA is the sort of one of the key central focus points for uh, for the future flight program as a whole. Um, and what we would expect uh, to do is integrate it directly uh, into uh, sort of ground based uh, ground based sensors that allow uh, for detect and avoid. Now, within our systems, actually, all of our systems are supplied with. An ADSB receiver, uh, but not a not necessarily not in all cases 
a, uh, a transceiver where you can then also transmit. Uh, so it's ADSB in, not out. Um, we would expect that as, as manufacturers of drones improve or uh, sort of accelerate the development, they're probably going to integrate this capability of ADSB out into the drones themselves. Of course, there's some considerations around size, weight, and power. Uh, but this is what we would expect. Uh, the drone industry would be able to handle this by themselves, and our goal would be to integrate it. However, again, through the Innovate UK project, we've experimented with a whole host of things, integrating with UTM service providers that can deal with a detect and avoid uh, challenge. Uh, I know Yen, uh, you may have touched on it before, but you know his, his service is supposed to also look at the uh, DAA coverage across an area. Um, so it's quite a, sorry, I'm, I'm waffling a little bit, but it's, it's quite a, it's quite a small piece of the pie, I think, that I've spoken about because it's such a comprehensive challenge that needs to be addressed. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for that. Uh, so the ne next question, um, how concerned are you with over-reliance on satellite positioning in an increasingly congested airspace? Are you using any alternative solutions alongside this? Uh, yes. So. Uh, using uh, GNSS, GPS, um, satellite-based navigation services, um, it's it's how we do today in the drone industry, the vast majority of sort of you know, waypoint management flying from point A to point B. Uh, it will typically use this. Um, however, uh, the industry is growing and it's coming along quite nicely. We, we never use just GPS for landing purposes or uh, recovery purposes. Uh, we always merge this with additional technologies that can allow to either visually detect where the drone station is, um, as well as things like ultra wideband or other sort of um, uh, high accuracy proximity uh, maneuver technologies. Um, so that was a long way of saying other positioning systems, uh, but we we do integrate this with a lot of other subsystems to to effectively achieve the the, the landing system, uh, the landing service. Uh, in the future, however, we, there are research programs where uh, companies are now using 5G by itself to triangulate the position of a uh, of a system, of a body of an autonomous vehicle. Uh, we're involved in some of these projects, and this will have add, I guess, a layer of uh, robustness to that positioning system. Um, we will do. We we expect that the the urban environment is, of course, the, the biggest challenge, but. We've also operated uh, in, in, in quite complex uh, environments. We have systems within cities already. Um, one interesting feature maybe just to add to this before I waffle for too long is that um, we actually, when we fly, we can map out based on log, uh, log files, we can map out where the drone system was able to get good positioning data as opposed to where it's bad. And then from this data, we can then sort of map out where it's appropriate to fly and where it's not. Of course, there's a lot more considerations to consider here, uh, but uh, but we, we were able to do sort of analytics as well as merge with new technologies to, to sort of improve on this. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, next question then. Um, so how does your solution handle navigation in potentially degraded GPS situations are using visual odometry type systems? So I think there's a bit of an overlap there, but. Uh, yeah, a little bit of an overlap. Um, so dead reckoning systems or uh, as well as visual odometry. Um, we haven't experimented a whole lot with this. Uh, we have done in the past, particularly when we were looking at takeoff and landing on mobile systems, maritime systems, uh, and also indoor flying. Um, the capability is there. If the navigation system is commercially available, you can, of course, integrate it into our system. Um, uh, however, as a standard product, we don't typically provide um, the, these kinds of services on top because we, we're usually involved from the site survey uh, step to the deployment and installation step to the testing step. We make sure that the system is going to work before we leave it there. Brilliant. Um, next one is, uh, with what frequency does the box have to be reviewed or maintained to ensure safe use? That's, that's really good, but it's also quite a it's quite a dynamic answer. The some systems that have been positioned by the coastline, for example, we have seen a uh, faster degradation. So things like uh, rusting, uh, we have metal sort of uh, lines on our uh, on the station. You see that rust quite quickly, and there we encourage the user to sort of inspect and maintain uh, more frequently to give us a heads up when when required. But other maintenance activities involve, for example, making sure that the uh, cameras are clean, so we have a security camera that looks at the drone station. 
uh, which is effectively engaged uh, before before you deploy um, to make sure that the sort of environment is safe to fly. Uh, so we encourage people to to clean these systems. Uh, the landing pad, if for example, if you've had, uh, well, I'm trying to think of an example, but like imagine leaves or something or dust or sand were to collect on it, you know, make sure that that is, uh, that is clear of debris. Um, but the, the biggest maintenance components really is the drone battery. This is the fastest thing to degrade uh, and the propellers. These two things need to be checked routinely and we can also detect uh, uh, if, for example, from the log files, if the drone is shaking, we sort of, we can put two and two together and uh, suggest we swap the propellers. Um, however, these are the fastest things to degrade. And so we encourage, depending on how often they are used, that you, you sort of conduct us, you know, an exchange of batteries. So you take one battery, swap it out uh, and send the other one back to us for, for replacement. Brilliant, thank you. Um, next one for Ian, I think this will be interesting for some of the smaller companies on the call. So, so where do small businesses fit into the big picture? Um, especially when a lot of contracts are kind of let to kind of large organizations, maybe? Yeah, that's a good question. I think certainly um, within the nuclear industry, there's a perception that it is close job. And to be honest, I think from my experience over 20 years, <laughs> there's probably some truth in that. The, the contracts generally are let to, uh, well, bundle together and let through a tier two. It isn't always that those tier twos are looking out for novel ideas. Um, they're probably, and I've worked for a few of them, quite interested in looking at the big multi-million pound contracts because that's they're going to get the revenue. Um, when when it comes to UAV activity or UAS activity, it's not multi-million pounds. That's, that's so that it's not attractive at the moment for large corporations uh, unless they can start managing data. So uh, and currently, as you know, um, there needs to be an air gap uh, within these sites. So contracting out data management uh, is frowned upon a little bit. So I think for small businesses, they have a huge uh, input. And I think um, the industry is now changing to look at and setting up little divisions within the organization to actually get this innovation out, to tease it out, to bring it in. I know up at Sellafield, they've now commissioned an offsite facility. And the offsite facility there specifically, because that's my next role actually, is to be an intelligent client uh, within that capability, is to actually go out to the world and look for these smaller companies, bring them to the site and demonstrate their wares and what they can do and how they can help rapidly decommission these sites. And I think there's a need for that. Um, so I think the opportunity for small businesses is actually quite good at the moment. Perhaps, perhaps previously, it would be a bit of a challenge. Thanks, that's brilliant. I think Hannah's Thank jumped on to add to that. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to add to that if I can. Um, so the Catapult Network was set up to enable um, innovation to cross the valley of death, so to turn from a, from a good idea into a commercial product. So we actually at CPC have um, an SME engagement team that's role is specifically to be um, joining, joining those dots. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we also are able to uh, run activities such as accelerator programs and research innovation um, grants through the various different mechanisms that we have. We're currently running a future of air mobility accelerator at the moment. Um, that's looking for um, at, at uh, TRL level that's quite close to commercialization. And one of the challenges um, that you, you quite rightly identified is the procurement processes. So CPC are actually actively working in looking at um, innovative procurement, um, if you like. Um, and accelerators is one of the ways to do that. So you de-risk um, the um, interacting with the SME um, and that you get to build a relationship through that accelerator process such that you can then develop into a commercial contract later on. The research and innovation grants um, 
are also another way to um, really focus your earlier stage TRL um, innovations. Um, and both of those um, constructs are driven by the end user or the tier one that, that wants to um, then onboard your products into their supply chain. So um, there, there are a number of different initiatives that we're running. Um, so I'd encourage you to um, keep in touch with us. Sign up for the newsletter if you're not already. Um, keep in touch through the Pathfinder programme as we will be running um, further accelerators, um, our accelerators supported by Future Flight Challenge. Um, so there, there will be activities going on next year in this space. Um, and we do have an active, innovative procurement programme going on at the moment as well um, to try and hopefully change that landscape somewhat um, from, from where we are or encourage the, the policy makers around that to consider um, uh, different approaches. So thank you. Thanks for that, Hannah. Really useful. A um, few more. We've got five minutes left, so a, a couple more technical questions, and I'll, and then we'll uh, we'll kind of wrap up. So, um, a, a couple more for for Ed. So, are you recharging batteries or hot swapping? Uh, so we have um, well, we are recharging batteries at the moment, uh, but we have a. I don't know if I want to say it. Uh, we have a, we have a couple of prototypes of the sort of hot swapping capability and, and multi UAS. Um, uh, research projects that we'll look to commercialize later on this year. Brilliant. Uh, and, and what's the what's been the regulator's position in regards to the lack of um, a PIVCO or you know A two CFC um, for those overseeing Herotech A ops, so the security staff, etc. Yeah. So this is um this was actually really exciting for us. Um, it was actually a requirement that was of course it was pushed out by by the client. Um, who was very, you know, strict in saying we don't want to depend on pilots going out for external training uh, with sort of a whole host of different different providers. Uh, we really want to gun for a means of just introducing a security guard, uh, have someone train that security guard up over the period of the day um, to use the system and use the system well, uh, well and safely. Um, so the regulator, it, you know, uh, we we always, when it comes to regulations uh, or the regulators, we always approach this in a and provide almost like a three-step plan. The goal of whatever safety case or, or SORA that we apply for, we we start with the loss to demonstrate how good the system is, how capable the system is, before migrating to something slightly more complex. It might be BV loss, for example, but with someone supervising. And then it might then you move that uh, supervisor or observer or whatever it is that you put in there. And then you sort of, the end goal is of course, um, not observed BV loss, well, BV loss in the, the, the true sense of it. Um, what we often do is we put together a test plan, uh, which we require the regulator to sort of either accept or, or, or reject. Uh, and then we amend it and then we submit again. But the test plan basically outlines what this look like uh, looks like what this three-stage plan goes through and <clears throat> this is really useful because it allows us to come back after stage one and say we would like to make these changes uh, in order to successfully deliver stage two do the same thing modify the processes make the regulator uh, much more comfortable with our system before unlocking that sort of stage three uh, so it's been it's been complicated and it's been a bit tasking, uh, but you know we're very happy with the permissions we have there. Um, uh, you know, so I think they, you know, the regulator is as well because they they signed a hook on it. Brilliant. Okay, well that's um, pretty much for all our questions, and um, we're almost out of time. So it's been um, it's been really great to hear from from both of you. Um, thanks for answering those questions, and thanks for everyone sending the the questions in. Um, I think it's really interesting to see what's around the corner. Uh, I think there's a lot to be excited.